Well, hello there. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and we are back with another Warbird Wednesday. We're staying in trainer land right now. We did the Stearman last week. We're on to the Fairchild PT-19A, and I am here today with my munificent assistant. He's really giving me a workout. Greg, you are working me out here. And for those of you that don't uh, or are coming in late to the series, we always do. Uh, we, we started this actually when we were locked in the museum for three months, and we want, people were saying, hey, we'd love to see the airplanes, so we do videos about them. One of the fun things that we tried to do was let the staff pick a hat and actually make fun of me a little bit. So I always wear a goofy hat. And then we do a thing called the stage two halfway through where we do a, a tribute to an airplane or a crew or something like that. So uh, that is no different. Today I have on my vintage, munificent assistant, my vintage 1930s. I don't know, this would probably be called a wrap or if I really wanted to date myself uh, the great Karnak. The kids will have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, but the great Karnak wore this. I'm going to take this off because it's a bit warm in the hangar today. I'm going to toss this. Another great catch by the indomitable Greg. Indomitable and munificent. I've got like some big words going on today. So we're in trainer land and what we're talking about uh, primarily are trainers that came out. We went all the way back to the beginning with the Wright brothers and then kind of worked up to the steermen, all the biplanes. And now we're going to take a walk into the transition. The steermen, the PT-17, was really the last of the biplanes, as we talked about, a big, heavy biplane. And it was a step in the transition from um, really backyard airplanes into more formalized training. And all the air forces were doing it with different types of aircraft uh, all over the world, but they were working them in. So uh, now where we're going is we're going to take a step into another airplane. This aircraft came into service, the PT-19A, the Fairchild, came into service uh, in 1940. Overall, there were about 7,700 of them built. There were all different types. There, we're going to talk about the engine on this. This had an inline engine. There was also a radial version of this airplane built. But this is now another step into more formalized training. And the idea behind it, we're going to talk about the geometry of this airplane. And there's some really interesting uh, break points as to how this airplane actually caused some bigger changes in, in trainers down the line. We're going to get into that as well. So the Sherman Fairchild, the Fairchild Aircraft Company in the mid-1920s, it was founded and they started building airplanes. Now the interesting thing about Fairchild is Fairchild went all the way into the, C, the C-119 uh, cargo airplane. They built sections for the B-52. They were involved in the A-10. They were involved in the space shuttle. They built a lot of different things. Like a lot of the consolidation that's gone with, on with aerospace, they have been gobbled up successfully, successively by companies. But Fairchild has a long history in aviation, either building airplanes or building sections for other people, for their airplanes. This particular aircraft in 1940 came in, and the big things about it, and I'm going to reach around here and grab my munificent assistant. I'm going to grab a P-51. Now, this is not a PT-19A, but I'm going to use the P-51, and you get the plan view of the P-51, as an example of where we're going. So we're moving out of biplanes and we're moving into we talked about low wing monoplanes now the why were we doing that remember the steerman had a fairly narrow stance on the gear it was big and heavy and it could bite you so we talked about that a little bit go back to that video i'm not going to re, re uh, revisit that but with this particular airplane now we're taking a step towards the trainers whether it's the primary or the secondary trainers looking much like the, these really high horsepower fighters that they were going to get into. And so with this airplane behind me, you can see low wing. We've widened the stance on the gear. I don't know if you can see that, but the gear stance on this airplane, Greg, maybe get a pickup shot. The gear stance on this airplane is much wider. So from a standpoint of stability and landing, we, we now have an airplane that is more stable. 
Now for the kids at home, I'm going to tell you about something. We're going to talk about this wing loading. I want you to go and look up what wing loading is. The wing loading on this airplane, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the wing loading on this airplane is now getting very similar to the low wing aircraft that these are guys are going to fly as they move into more and more complex airplanes. So we're talking about wing loading now. We're getting into uh, characteristics of the aircraft down the line. Like I said, more complex airplane. It is a tail dragger, so it is dragging its tail. It's got a wide stance. You can see the view from the cockpit is now very much similar to the what these down the line fighters. Now, one thing that's interesting, Greg, is if you'll pan over to my right, you'll see the T6 and the SNJ. So we kind of have the syllabus of where these airplanes are going uh, when you're going to go in training. So we got that T6 and SNJ over here to my right. That particular airplane we will do uh, a, a follow up on in another segment. So Fairchild was, was interesting in that it also started, and I'm going to put this down, started the move to uh, different power plants. Let's talk about power plants. This particular engine here is a Ranger, an L440 engine. It uh, went in the Fairchild. This literally is mounted the way it went in the airplane. Now, a couple of things are going to jump out. What are they, Greg? What are they? Notice it is mounted inverse, right? So the exhaust, and you can see, with it, well, Greg will get a pickup shot on the exhaust on this airplane, but it's down low opposed to that V12 with the P51 being up higher, it's also, Greg, an inline engine. You can see all the cylinders, all six cylinders are inline and there's a range around a crankshaft. Now, little known fact, Greg, little known fact, what is it? These engines take their lineage back to what? What do you think? Uh, munificent, Greg. They take their, their lineage back to locomotives and to bicycles. Well, how can that be, you say? How can that be? Well, think about it this way. As we move into metallurgy, everything from all the way back when we were fashioning bronze into iron and everything else, we were learning how to make metal harder as we used it. And as we got into more complex machines and we had this componentry coming together, we were making harder and harder metal. That really set the stage in locomotive construction for hardening steel. Remember, we were using steam in locomotives primarily, but those parts were getting really hot and they had to be really hard. The metal had to be hard. So we were getting better and better in locomotives and that set the stage for the componentry in these engines as far as how the metallurgy came together. So the thing I didn't know, and what's really uh, just blows my mind, is that Dahmer actually built, and we're talking about V's versus inline engines, actually built the first V engine, cylinder engine, and Greg, you can go out and get some graphics on this, back in, I believe it was 1898 or 1900. Think about that for a second, that we had engines with pistons and they were using internal combustion at that time that far back. Now, what is the benefit from these various engines? On a six-cylinder in inline engine, primarily uh, it's a little less complex as far as the cams and, and the valves. The engine is complex, less complex. The drawback is, what do you think the drawback is? Right? As you add cylinders, what does the engine get? It gets longer and longer and longer. And when you add the length, what do you get? Weight, which is one thing. You get a lot more weight. And so the V engines, now that V engine that I talked about that Dolmer built was all, and by the way, if you don't, Dolmer is a very familiar name. If you don't know that name, go out and look it up. That's another one for the kids. But you know who that engine was designed by, Greg? Maybach. Maybach, another very familiar name. Go out and look both of those up. Tremendous history in uh, motor cars and engines, but that was a, of the V engine was originally, I think it was a two-cylinder V engine, 
It was originally designed that far back. So in certain applications and in your cars, and, and many of you may have had a, a flathead six or a slant six, the six is, uh, the six-cylinder inline engine was, was used quite extensively. But as we were moving into bigger power plants, we started to see the V engines. Now, why V engines, Greg? Why? Why? Because you want to put that cool V8 sticker on the side? No, that's not, Greg's nodding his head. That's what he wants. No, you can't do that. The idea was that you had, instead of you had combustion cylinders run all the way down this crankshaft, you could have two cylinders, and Greg can get an animation of this, I'm sure, somewhere. You had two cylinders, so twice the action, two cylinders on the crankshaft, shortening up the length of the engine. So that did two things. Gave you more power, and it also gave you um, a, shorter, uh, a shorter engine and less weight. And so that was the reason why we saw this march towards the... It wasn't that inline engines weren't good, and in inline engines, like in this application, they work perfectly fine. I mean, it's a great thing. But as you're starting to get, especially in a 12-cylinder engine, and there were 12-cylinder inline engines, but as you're starting to get into aircraft where you're trying to save weight and you're trying to get more power, that V's type of design of engine <coughs> became very important. So that is how this engine uh, is, uh, came about. It is, uh, these engines migrated as far as design, and they migrated into cars, and there was other things that they did. But, but that was the base of this of this engine. So now let's talk about this airplane. As I said, wing loading and the design were very similar to step up into either more complex trainers or fighters. This was still an airplane, two-place airplane, an instructor and a pilot. Uh, it was still an airplane that could bite you, it could wash you out, um, and you had to be careful. This is an airplane where you, they decided whether or not you had the aptitude to be able to fly. You would, they'd, they'd sort you out in this airplane. So it is two-place instructor and uh, the trainee. Um, now, there's another interesting thing about this airplane, and I use interesting a lot. I'm going to use it again. This wing is what, Greg? It's plywood. There's a lot of wood and bonded wood in this wing. Now, what do you think happens when you take this airplane down south into like Florida or into high humidity areas? What happens with plywood? It warps. They had a lot of problems, and this airplane is notorious, and why you have to do uh, a lot of work on this airplane and making sure that um, when you inspect it, this is a flying version of this airplane. We're going to talk about that in a second. We we do operate this airplane, but you have to be really careful when you're doing a review on this wing and you're doing a review on the spars and the wing route. This airplane has that plywood wing. Now, this airplane caused something, Greg. You know what that is? What it caused? It caused the Army Air Corps in the next... Remember, we've talked about this before. The, the services put out like a design requirement and then all of the manufacturers respond to it and they design airplanes to that request. This airplane was the one that caused the requirement by the Army Air Force and the U.S. Air Force after this to, you know what it was? Require an all-metal wing. An all-metal. This was the airplane that caused it because they had so much trouble with uh, delamination and uh, plywood issues in this wing that they actually changed the requirement for all the trainers down the line. Now, uh, it looks like an antique. Um, what's interesting is it's actually later. To me, the airplane looks more antique than the Stearman. If antique, I don't know if antique is a word. I don't know that it's a word. But it looks more antique to me, but it actually came in later uh, than the Stearman. It's primarily gone on to be an enthusiast's airplane. A lot of enthusiasts fly this airplane. It's had some updates. One thing over here, Greg, a little uh, Fred fun feature. I don't know that we've ever done a Fred Fun feature. Have we ever done one of those? Munificent, munificent Greg, you're giving me a tremendous workout on the word today. This is actually for a crank. So you would crank this motor over. Now this airplane actually has a starter, but in the old days, if you really wanted to, like the old Model T's, you see them kind of wind the engine up, 
it had a crank start in it. I am not sure that I would be brave enough to stand behind this thing with a crank start. That's kind of spooky. So uh, that was where the crank start went. Now, let's move on. We're going to go over here, and I'm going to get into my stage two today. Greg has, that's another thing with the, with the feature. Greg kind of goes out and buys really obscure drinks and uh, feeds them to me on the air with the hope. He actually has done it with Brainwash. He actually, uh, there was a, I refer to it as the poisoning incident where I was nearly killed by that. Maybe that's job security. I don't know, Greg. This today in down south, this is Dublin Cherry Limeade. And if you've been yeah. down south, Cherry Limeade, and, and they have very sweet tea and all kinds of little things. This is made by the, by the way, Dublin Cherry Limeade is not a sponsor of the program. They are not. Uh, this is uh, Dublin Bottling Works, Dublin, Texas. So I don't know whether Dublin, Texas is in South Texas. Maybe somebody could tell me that. Um, always made, Greg, you're doing it again. A, a, um, always made with pure cane sugar. So that's uh, another, um, let's see. There are only 100 calories in this. So the last one was 170. So you've reduced my calorie count, munificent Greg. So I appreciate that. Uh, and it says this is a Dublin original. Now, what we're going to do today is we are going to honor one of the uh, flight demonstration teams because you know what happened. They got a new airplane. The Blue Angels just accepted the first Super Hornet. They're retiring their legacy Hornets. And for those of you who don't know what a legacy Hornet is, that's an old airplane, right? They... they the, they've got the hand-me-downs, so now they're updating to a Super Hornet, more power, better flight envelope. So to the Blue Angels, we want to say congratulations on your new airplane, and at some point maybe you'll actually, they're down in El Centro, they're not that far from here, you know, from us. Maybe they'll actually come up and visit. If I say congratulations on your airplane, maybe they'll bring up a, a leg, or maybe they'll drop off a Legacy Hornet. Wouldn't that be nice? Greg is, is looking excited. Now, the always check the expiration after the uh, brainwash assault. Uh, I like assault even better. That's an, instead of incident. I was assaulted by that drink. Let's see. Uh, May 17, 20. So this one doesn't have the two-year shelf life that that last one you gave me to. But let's give it a shot. It has an interesting color. Um, it's almost like I'm doing a wine review. Interesting color. It has a, a, a brief, you know, let me wash it around here. Um, I, again, Greg, I, you know, I, this is like the third one in a row. You know, I know Josh Gates is hoping that I will keel over because I continue to give him such a hard time. By the way, Josh, I did not get happy birthday. Last week was my birthday. I got no happy birthday wish, dude. What is going on here? I'm giving you all that sort of backhand love and nothing at all. So, Josh, we miss you in your strange fur hat. But, yeah, I'm going to keep this, Greg. This, this is a good one. This is a good one. So, now, the, in this airplane, if you were flying in this airplane, we, we did not decapitate anyone. This is not an original pilot in his headgear. This is, but this is the type. Look at that cloth headgear. You see... I'm going to kind of turn it to the side here. You could see uh, they've got the headphones in there, but this is what they were wearing back then. There was not a lot of noggin protection here. If you had a problem, uh, you were pretty much on your own as far as protecting your head. The flight helmets are, are fairly uh, mandatory. A lot of our pilots have them. They're actually quite expensive, by the way, to get. Did you know that, Greg? To get a flight helmet with the comps are quite expensive. We fly with, uh, with flight helmets primarily. But, um, but these things, they had the intercom built in, but this was to protect you, maybe some goggles. And that was, as they say, about it. Now, if you rolled over this airplane, Greg, I'm going to let you go up. I'm going to grab my pencil here. Uh, you see that little thingy right there? That is not so King Kong can pick up the airplane uh, or uh, it attached to a Zeppelin. What is that, Greg? Do you have any idea what that is? You see that little thingamajig? 
That's the technical term for that. That thingamajig right there is in case the airplane rolls over. And that, so you don't break your neck. Isn't that nice? Very practical. You don't want a broken neck. So uh, it, we may not protect your head very well, but we are going to make sure that we don't break your neck. You, so you could get, crush your skull, but you're not going to get your neck broken. But this, this airplane um, had quite a few mishaps, uh, as the, all the trainers did uh, during that time frame. As I, as I said, they were trying to sort people out. Now, this particular aircraft is part of our flying fleet. Go out to the website and uh, it will eventually be on there. You'll be able to buy a ride in this, like with the Stearman. So you go out and go for a ride in this. Open air, lots of fun. Cruises at about uh, 110 miles an hour or so. Now this airplane, the other history on this airplane, this airplane is owned by Captain Charlie Plum. He was a POW, and you can learn about Charlie in our POW MIA exhibit in the Miles Hangar. Um, he was a POW from 1967 to 1973. Now, a side fact about how long you, or how big the world is and, and how people are interconnected. Remember we talked about Gordy, Gordy Jenkins flew our F-105. Charlie Plum actually knew. I had a friend who uh, his father was shot down in Vietnam. Charlie knew him. I was talking about him one day, and he actually flew with him. He literally knew him. How weird is that, that the world is so small that, you know, half a world away and all this time, I got into a conversation with him one time. He says, oh, yeah, I knew him, and we went on, and sure enough, it was the same guy. It is just amazing. But, Charlie, we want to thank you very much for letting us uh, operate your airplane as part of our flying fleet now. To our gratuitous product placement. One of the things <clears throat> that Greg does that is extremely important is his coloring books. And I make sure that Greg has as many coloring books as, as he can use. In this case, this is a really nice one. And it's got little descriptions there. And you can, all kinds of different cool little airplanes. But you can go out to the website and own this coloring book and be like Greg and make your own colored airplanes. The biggest challenge I have with Greg is getting Greg to color in the lines. The, I, we have a problem with that. He, he doesn't listen sometimes, but he doesn't color in the lines. Now the other thing, and this is just kind of neat because it relates to this. I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to show you this. Now, what is this, you may ask? This is the 21st Ferry Group. I would say kind of like a yearbook is the best way to describe it. And this is from, Greg, Palm Springs, California. So when you come to the museum, one of the things that's interesting is you could see these folks actually right where we are and then down into Palm Springs, you had all kinds of military aircraft that ferried through here. And when I see this, one of the things that's so cool is like, you can see there's a, a P-39 right over here. There were tie downs and all kinds of things in this area. So when you come to Palm Springs and check out the museum, some of the aircraft tie downs are still on the other side of the airfield. And we try to save them whenever you get, whenever we get a chance. And there was some training going on here. There was a WAC, a Women's uh, 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 Army Corps detachment here with wasps that were flying. And so there was a lot of stuff that went through here. But this, when you come to the museum, one of the things you want to check out is we have the largest aviation military archive that is non-governmental on the West Coast. You want to come and check this out and look at all this cool stuff upstairs. And at some point, hopefully, after the COVID mess, you can also, is mess a good word? Mess, a kind of COVID crisis, whatever. You can actually go up and we have flight simula simulators up there. But if you're doing research um, and historians, check out, reach out to Greg or myself and we have a lot of source archive material up there and you can go check all this stuff out. And this is something you should do. So I'm gonna put that back. I'm gonna pick up my stage two I am going to salute my munificent assistant, Greg Kenny. Oh my goodness, that is so good. You know, they're going to make me stop doing these because you're giving me all the sugar. 
Remember, get out to that uh, to our uh, website or web store and get that coloring book. Remember, smash that subscribe button, like us on Facebook, and thank you for joining me for another uh, episode of Warbird Wednesday. Have a great day.